Okay, I'm going to spend five minutes finishing up uh, what we were talking about with correlation functions from last time, and then we're going to go on to under radiation, which is the first step towards talking about radiation. So, uh, we were talking about the analytic structure of correlation functions, and I want to finish by talking talk mostly about two point functions, and I want to explain the general situation for higher point functions. Um, so, let's think about a four point function o of x1 o of x2, o of x3, o of x4. Um, and all four points we can move around in Minkowski space, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to freeze three of them to be space-like separated, x2, x3, and x4, and I'm going to think of this as a function of x1. Um, in particular, um, just to keep thinking, we can, we can move x1 all around, but uh, to illustrate this, I'm just going to think of it as a function of t1. So um, x1 is t1 vector x1, and we'll just think of it as a function of t1. Okay, so what does the correlation function look like as a function of t1? To answer that question, uh, we go to the tau1 plane. So uh, remember, we, uh, we're sort of thinking of the theory as defined in Euclidean signature. So in, in Euclidean time, um, tau 1. So Euclidean time is when tau 1 is real. The Euclidean correlator uh, is defined with tau 1 along the, the real axis here. And uh, we said that correlation functions are, are have no, uh, have no, um, ambiguities or branch cuts, so everything is perfectly well defined along in, in Euclidean signature, so everything is perfectly well defined there. Uh, but just as we saw for the two point function, if we move into Lorentzian, um, so if we move along this direction, that corresponds on the tau 1 plane to going up the imaginary tau axis. So I should have said maybe in this picture, this is a Lorentzian picture. Where, where t runs up, uh, but that corresponds to um, t running up in this picture uh, because that's imaginary tau. And when this point hits the light cone of um, one of the other insertions here, that's going to correspond to a branch point on the uh, on the tau plane. Okay, so there's a branch cut for each of these points. There's there's one corresponding to the light cone of x3. There's another one corresponding to the light cone. Why did I start at 3? There's one for 2, there's one for 3, and there's one for 4. And similarly, if we go back, um, then we get branch cuts from hitting the, um, the backwards light cones. Okay. And now, when we talk about this function, that means that if we start by defining the function somewhere in Euclidean, and now we want to go to Lorentzian, there's lots of different ways that we can do it. Now, say, say we're going um, all the way up to a point where we're time-like separated from everything. So there's lots of ways we can get there. We can um, go like that. That, like that, we can take funny paths around. Uh, so there's lots of different ways that, that we can analytically continue to that point. And um, those different ways, uh, well, you can easily see how many there are. If we're time-like separated, every time we go time-like separated, we have two choices. Okay, and those two choices correspond to the two ways that you can order the operators in the uh, in the correlation function. Okay. So all the different uh, correlation functions with all the different orderings uh, that, that you can put here just correspond to all the different ways of going around the cuts. And things like uh, causality, and light cones, and all that are built into the analytic structure of this correlation function on a complex tau plane. Any questions?
So last time when we discussed about this two point functions, is that the two choices of uh, analytic continuation would give you the time ordered and anti time ordered correlators. Right? Yes. Uh, so like, is there a choice of contour that would give me a Whiteman function? Um, um, let's see. The, the question is not really well defined. Okay, so let me let me say what I mean by that. Um, so um, when we go up this way. We're talking about the Whiteman functions. All, in fact, all of the correlators I've I've written have been Whiteman functions. Like, if we if we take one path that corresponds to O one O two, etc. If we take the other path, that's O two O one, etc. Now these are Whiteman functions, uh, but they're Whiteman functions in which we've gone, in which O one is to the future of O two. Because that's what we, we did. We, we moved O1 to the future. But a Whiteman function where, where T, so T1 greater than T2. But a Whiteman function where T1 is greater than 2 is the same as a time ordered or anti time ordered correlation function. The difference between the Whiteman functions and the time ordered functions are what you do when you go the other way. Okay, so when you go down this way, um, you can define, a, if you define a Whiteman function, that would correspond to going this way if you go up, and also going this way if you go down. A time-ordered correlator would correspond to going this way if you go up, but this way if you go down. So it's just how you... Um, so it's like just, how you choose the two contours, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about unruh radiation. I'm going to start with um, some basic definitions, uh, very basic definitions in quantum mechanics, um, and then tell you what unruh radiation is. Okay, so suppose a Hilbert space. H um, factorizes. So suppose a Hilbert space H factorizes into a direct product of Hilbert spaces A and B. Um, then, given a density matrix uh, for the system H, that is an operator from H to H that obeys the usual properties of a density matrix, um, we can define uh, the reduced density matrix rho A is the trace over B of rho. So this is called the reduced density matrix. Um, has everyone seen this before? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, which of those contours corresponds to O two O one versus the other one? Is that a convention? Um, no, and I may have gotten it wrong in this picture because I didn't have it written down. It's not a convention, though. It's dictated by unitarity, uh, which I talked about the end last time. You have to go to momentum space and insert a complete set of states, and that'll tell you which is which. Okay, since everyone's seen this, I'm not going to give the simplest, um, the simplest example, uh, which I had written here involving two qubits, where you can uh, start with a bell pair of two qubits and do the partial trace um, very explicitly, and you can uh, see that you get a, a maximally mixed state of a single qubit. I'm not going to go through that example because you said you've seen this, but it's in the notes, uh, which will go on the website if you want to look through that simple example. Um, so when can you factorize a Hilbert space? Well, um, uh, 
lots of times, but um, often it's useful to factorize a Hilbert space according to positions in actual space. Okay, so uh, the the simplest example of this would be a spin chain, where you have a bunch of spins or qubits that are lined up in a row. Uh, then you can choose some of them to call A and the others to call B. And uh, the states of this spin chain are uh, things like sigma 1, sigma 2, dot, 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 up to sigma n, uh, where these are either up or down for each spin. Um, and of course, the, the states are defined independently, so we can think of this as the tensor product of uh, the single spin um, Hilbert spaces. That is, this is a tensor product to the n of h for a single spin. And um, we can package it into the Hilbert space of a and the Hilbert space of b. Now, um, in general, this splitting of Hilbert spaces doesn't have to have anything to do with actual space, but for the most part, that's the application that we're going to be using. So, um, in quantum, the point of, of the spin chain example is that in quantum mechanics, we can speak of the density matrix for a spatially de defined subregion of a quantum system that has some uh, organization in space. The key property of a reduced density matrix is that everything you calculate with a reduced density matrix agrees uh, as long as what you're calculating lives in region A or acts on the Hilbert space HA, uh, it agrees with the original density matrix. So that is for any OI acting in HA, uh, trace 01, 02, dot, 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 row A is equal to trace 01, 02, dot, 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 row. That's basically obvious from the definition, row A, as you do the trace over the B part. That doesn't, that, that doesn't even see the operators O because they don't they don't hit B. Um, so this is a sort of obvious fact, but it's crucial to interpretation. OK. Um, questions so far? same thing in QFT. Uh, so that is, if I draw a picture of space here, this is not space-time, this is just space. So this, think of this as R d minus 1, although it could, could be curved space as well. Um, then we can split space into two regions, A and its complement, B. similar to how we did in the spin chain. Um, and the story is pretty similar, but because it's Q of T, it's, not, uh, it's, it's more complicated. So it is almost true that in quantum field theory, uh, the Hilbert space is HA times HB. How can something be almost true? Okay, so there's two caveats. Uh, the first caveat um, is gauge theory. Okay, so in gauge theory, uh, the degrees of freedom do, 
of the gauge field don't really live on a site. Okay, so if you discretize a gauge theory, um, then the um, ordinary fields like charged stuff, uh, you can associate it to a site, to a given point. Uh, but the gauge field really lives on the link. Okay. If you discretize a gauge field, you get a, a theory of, of site variables and link variables. And um, you can see why that's going to be problematic, because if I try to split it into regions A and B, then um, I don't really know where, the, where, the, where to put the gauge degree of freedom. Um, a related fact is that gauge theories have Gauss constraints, that is, constraints on the physical Hilbert space that um, relate what's happening over there to, to what's happening over there in the definition of physical states. Okay, So we're not really going to need to worry about this too much. Um, let me just say that um, both of those subtleties in gauge theory can be dealt with. You just have to be careful about what you mean um, by, um, well, you have to be careful about, about how you deal with the link fields. Um, and it's not quite true that this tensor product uh, gives the Hilbert space. It actually gives something, something bigger than that, because you have to impose the Gauss constraint to get the physical Hilbert space. Okay, the other caveat uh, is present in all quantum field theories. And that's uh, the problem of UV divergences. Okay, so it's not quite true that you can define a Hilbert space associated to B and a different associated to A that factorize from each other. Um, if you try to write down the, dense, the corresponding density matrices, you'll encounter UDV divergences and it just won't make any sense. Um, now, it is true that if I put a little regulator there, and I talk about A as being the inside and, and B as being outside that slightly enlarged surface, um, that now, um, now these are independent of each other. Um, but they don't quite get the whole get the whole theory because they're missing they're missing what's what's in that gap that we, where we regulated. Um, okay, so I wanted to mention that caveat, but there are techniques to deal with these UV divergences. You cannot just ignore them. You have, they're they're important. They they change a lot of the a lot of the um, properties of entanglement and entanglement entropy and things like that that we'll talk about are fundamentally changed by the fact that these UV divergences exist. They're, they're crucial. We have to keep track of them. Uh, but there, there are methods for, for, for dealing with it. And we'll kind of see how they, how they enter. But um, they don't really change the intuition that uh, you can think of the Hilbert space as factorizing into subregions. Okay? You can still think of it this way. You just have to keep track of the UV divergences. Um, so let me leave it at that for now, and uh, we'll see these coming back later. This is a property of Rindler space. So what is Rindler space? Consider a quantum field theory in flat space time and divide space uh, into two regions with a planar dividing surface. 
Okay, so space here is R D minus one, and I'm just dividing along a plane, R D minus two. This is a picture of fixed time. Uh, and now in Lorentzian signature, we draw the space time picture. Then uh, it looks like this. So B is the piece of space on the left. A is the piece of space on the right. And um, what I've done is I've drawn the light cone uh, coming out of the dividing surface because that defines the causal diamonds, or they're not really diamonds, uh, it defines the causal development associated to each region. In particular, if I know initial conditions in region A, then I can use physics to figure out what's going on in this whole wedge uh, over here. And this is called the Rindler wedge, or Rindler space. Uh, and there's two of them, obviously, one for each side. Okay, now the question that we want to ask uh, is what is rho sub a? The reduced density matrix of quantum fields in uh, region A. That is, we want to take a quantum field theory uh, and we want to trace out half of space. So far, so good. Okay, first I'm going to make the claim and then we're going to derive it. Um, there's a vector field, which I'll call zeta sub y, uh, which is a, the vector field that tells you how to boost in the y direction. So the Lorentz boost, uh, sorry, this I'm going to call, so this is t, t goes up, and I'll call y this direction to the right. OK, so there's a Lorentz boost in the y direction. And there's associated vector field for that Lorentz boost, um, which looks like something like this. The, the vector field also uh, can be defined in the um, past and future wedges, although we're not going to use it in those wedges. We're only going to use it in the Rindler space time. So this vector field uh, for the Lorentz boost is t dy plus y dt. If you're not used to that notation, then uh, this is t y hat plus y hat. These are just the unit vectors in the y and t directions. Let k be the generator of these boosts. Generator means the conserved charge associated to boosts. Okay, well, we're used to thinking of conserved charge associated to angular momentum, rotations, or associated to time translations, that's the energy. But there's a conserved charge associated to boosts, which I'll write down the formula for in a minute. Um, that's K. Then the um, basic claim of unradiation 
is that uh, rho sub a is equal to e to the minus 2 pi ka, where uh, ka is the generator of boosts uh, reduced to the, the A region. And I'll write a formula for that, too. OK, so that's the claim. That's what we want to show. Uh, in particular, it's a thermal state. Okay, so This takes the, the form e to the minus beta h. Um, but it's a funny thermal state. It's not an ordinary thermal state. It's a thermal state. Uh, with respect to boosts, that just means this formula. It means that the, 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 the energy, the thermal state, is the, is the boost energy. Uh, so it's a thermal state with respect to boosts. And it's at a particular temperature. Uh, the inverse temperature here is 2 pi. So it's a temperature 1 over 2 pi. Note that um, this temperature is dimensionless. It's a number. That is not because I've set some units. That's because um, boost energy is dimensionless. It's like angular momentum. Angular momentum is dimensionless, unlike, unlike energy. Uh, so, so boost energy is, is, well, is, a, is a dimensionless charge. OK, that's a claim. So we're going to show this. Questions? This probably seems sort of formal at the moment, uh, but let me just jump ahead and say that this is a real temperature. If, if you, so the physical interpretation of this is going to be that accelerating observers feel a temperature. These accelerating observers will follow the, the Rindler boost vector. Uh, we'll come to that, but I want to start out with this sort of formal discussion first, and then we'll come to the consequences. So um, first I want to write more explicitly, this uh, boost charge K. So we have a stress tensor T B nu. The Hamiltonian is the energy, uh, which is the integral over space of the energy density T0,0. A more covariant way of writing that um, is the integral over space d d minus 1 x square root of h u mu u nu t mu nu, uh, where h is the space metric and uh, u here is the time like unit normal, uh, that is t hat, or dt. Uh, for any killing vector, that is for any symmetry of the space time, in this case we're just talking about Minkowski space, so for any of the Poincaré generators, uh, zeta, uh, we can define a charge q of zeta, which is the integral over some spatial slice d sigma mu t mu nu, zeta nu.
the Hamiltonian or the energy is one example of this. To just to clarify this, so um, this notation here uh, means we're dotting into the area element. That's this thing here is the area element. We're dotting into that. Um, so that gives you one of these unit normals here. So so there, one of these unit normals comes from dotting into the area element. And uh, this other one is the killing vector associated to energy. Okay, so this one, uh, okay, so there's, there's, they're playing two different roles. Uh, one, is the nor one is the dot into the area element, and the other is the, the killing vector whose uh, charge we're talking about, the energy, okay? So that, that D sigma is like the volume form and you can bet one of the uh, space like for the, the time I think normal is so you want to think about it. It's not the volume form, it's the area so well, it's the it's, area form it's the the area form. Spatial slice once you but if it's a free form once you fed it in the U, right? Once it's a, four, it's a four form before you feed it the U, you know it's a three form. Yeah, that's right. The area element is a three form, which yeah. you can think of as feeding U to the four form. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sorry, feeding you. Okay, I'm not sure what feeding means, but I think oh, we, I think we, I think we agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It just means this formula. Okay, this is supposed to be a, this is supposed to be a quick way of writing this formula. Um, it's just another way of writing. So, um, in particular. Uh, we have this boost, this boost vector, zeta y, which uh, is a symmetry. It's boost, it's Lorentz boost, so that's a symmetry. And so we can define a conserved charge associated to it. That's what we call k. So k is the charge associated to zeta y. If we plug in our formula, um, well, let me make a comment first. This is true in general. Um, when, you, when you choose a spatial slice, when you choose a slice here, this Q, you could choose any spatial slice. It's a conserved charge, that's the point. If you choose a different spatial slice, you'll get the same answer, okay? So uh, when we define the conserved charge associated to boosts, it's convenient to pick this slice that goes right through the middle. We don't have to pick that slice, it's a conserved charge, um, but I'm gonna write the formula um, on this slice. Okay. Yeah? There's no restrictions on it being like space slice. This, the slice has to be a spatial slice, but um, that's the only restriction. There are issues with there is, there can be issues with um, boundary conditions at infinity um, that we don't have to worry about at the moment. Okay, so I'm just going to pick this slice uh, to write my formula. So. Uh, we have an integral over the spatial slice. That's integral dy from minus infinity to infinity. Remember, y is this direction. There's an integral into the board. Okay, remember we're we're working in d dimensions, so there's a there's a suppressed direction here. There's an integral the direction into the board, which is two by, uh, d minus two dimensions. I'll call that x perp. And um, now we have to write these, now we have to write the normals. Okay, so um,
there's a, um, so the, the normal is just, the normal of this slice is just t hat. Okay, the normal, vec the vector field that's normal to this is just t hat, right? Okay, so we get a t, uh, t mu, zeta y mu. And um, this, just doing the dot product here, um, so this is T, T Y, um, zeta Y, which is T, uh, plus T, 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 uh, zeta T, which is a Y. But we chose to do this calculation on the t equals zero slice. Uh, so this is zero. Okay, so the boost charge k is the integral dy from minus infinity to infinity. Integral d d minus two x perp y t t t. That's the conserved charge associated with boosts. Or the energy um, associated to boosts. Okay. So now that we've defined everything, We've defined K, um, and now we're going to derive this formula uh, for the, the density matrix. Uh, I suppose I should write a formula for K sub A. I think it's obvious uh, what it should be. K sub A. So we have this. This is an operator that we're writing. Um, and this operator, uh, the piece of this operator associated to region A is just that piece of the integral. Okay, so Ka is the integral dy from 0 to infinity, integral dx perp y t t t. formula can be derived without ever talking about Euclidean signature. Remember, Euclidean signature is our tool. It's a trick that we use when it's convenient. Um, so you could do this without ever going to Euclidean. And the, uh, that's done in Carroll. I put this in the reading and on the homework. Um, but I'm not going to do it that way in lecture. Um, I'm going to do it in a way that I find much more intuitive. It's also more general, and it's also faster. And that's using Euclidean path intervals. It's important to do both, though. Okay, this is this is very general, but it feels like magic, and you kind of have to work through the details um, of the of the derivation of Carroll um, to feel like you really understand what's going on. Okay, so um, the starting point is the vacuum state. I should, I think, I, I don't know if I mentioned this or I didn't emphasize it. Of course, when we talk about the reduced density matrix in a region, we have to say what state we're in to start. And I don't know if I said it, we're, I'm talking about the vacuum state. Okay, so we start in the vacuum state in the full space time. And the statement about thermal density matrix in Rindler space is the reduced density matrix in the vacuum state. Okay, so we start in vacuum. As we discussed in all this Euclidean path integral discussion, you can think of this vacuum state as this Euclidean path integral. 
Okay, so what is this? This is on the top is a half of RD, the Euclidean, it's a half of the Euclidean space time, which you, th you should think of as um, one of these. I can't remember which one's the broad, which one's the cat. And the um, bottom is another representing the other vector state. Which, as, you, as usual, this is a prescription telling you how to calculate matrix elements. So how do you cal calculate the matrix elements of rho? You feed it uh, field data on the left and on the right. In the path integral, that feed field data enters as boundary conditions on this cut and boundary conditions on that cut. with this, just the vacuum state. Now we want to go to our definition. So our goal is to calculate the reduced density matrix rho A. And we're just going to go straight to the definition. This is the trace over B of rho. On this picture, um, A and B correspond to this part of the picture. Right, because that, because those cuts there, that's space, and we divided space into two regions, A and B. Okay. I'm going to calculate the matrix elements of this thing, just because it's a little clearer. So the matrix elements of row A like this. Um, this notation, phi 1a, means field data on region A. Okay, so matrix elements of rho A, we have, we, if we want to work in the field basis, we should feed it field data in region A twice. By the definition of rho sub A, uh, this is the sum over phi b of phi 2a comma phi b rho phi 1a comma phi b. Um, I don't know why I put that b down. The down or up doesn't mean anything. OK, because the full density matrix acts on the Hilbert space associated to all of space. So the, the states on all of space in the field basis have, um, have, you have to specify the field both in region A and in region B. Good. Let's write the path integral for this. This is the sum over phi B. Um, rho, we're just, we're just putting in here the vacuum state, 0, 0. Okay, so for, for, um, hat, for the bottom half of this, we put the data phi b in region b and phi 1a in region a. For the other half, uh, we put the data phi b in region B, and phi 2a in region A. So I've just translated, we have, we're calculating, there's, there's a product of two overlaps here, and I've just translated each of those overlaps into a path integral on um, half of Euclidean space with some boundary conditions.
Okay, continuing that equation. Um, so we have a sum over b, we have a sum over phi b, and then we put phi b on the top and on the top part and on the bottom part. But that just says fields are continuous as you walk across the manifold this way. You can walk from one to the other, and everything is continuous because we set them equal and then summed over them. So as we saw before, when we did traces in the thermal state, uh, this partial trace glues the manifolds together. Okay, so the path integral that we have now looks like this. So in region B, we set the fields equal and summed over them. That is the effect of just gluing the manifold together. This is a statement about path angles. Okay, so we've glued the manifold together. But in region A, we have not glued the manifold together. Uh, if, if it helps, maybe you could think of this as sort of a Pac-Man. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like this, where you have one boundary condition here and a different boundary condition there. but it's easier to draw it that way. So you have this cut on the manifold with different boundary conditions on the top and bottom of the cut. I wrote this as a formula for the matrix elements, but we could just as well write it as a formula for the operator itself, just by not specifying the, the field data. Okay, so the path integral representation of the operator row A is this. It's a path integral on a cut, on a cut Euclidean manifold with um, a cut uh, with, so there, there are two cuts here. I mean, in the sense of when we were talking about cut path integrals, there are two cuts in the sense that um, we have two places where we would have to specify boundary conditions to get a number. OK, this is the first key result. We're not done yet, but we're almost there. Does this formula make sense? Now the key step. We're just going to stare at this path integral and reinterpret it. So the way we're going to reinterpret it is with time in the in the in the angular direction. Okay, so um, if we slice it this way and think of this as time, which is the polar angle theta. What does it mean to think of this as time? Uh, it means that we now find a Hilbert space associated to to this half space. So there's a Hilbert space associated to the half space. And um, then the Hamil there's a Hamiltonian that takes you around like this. So usually, usually we think of the Hilbert space associated to, to these slices, and the Hamiltonian is taking us up the picture. But now we just think of the Hilbert space associated to region A, and the Hamiltonian is taking us around. And we had this field data, phi 2a, 
Phi 1a. I'm not sure whether my conventions go clockwise or counterclockwise, so um, let me not specify. Um, well, if we think about it that way, then by our usual rules of Euclidean path integrals, this is just e to the this is just the calculation of the matrix element for this Hamiltonian. We start with field data phi 1a, then we use this Hamilton, we act with this Hamiltonian to go a distance 2 pi, which is the, the distance of, in the theta direction, um, and then we put field data phi 2. So the conclusion so far is that rho a is e to the minus 2 pi q of d theta. It's the, where q of d theta is the conserved charge that generates motion in the theta direction. This Euclidean rotation um, d theta is just the usual rotation vector, t Euclidean dy minus y dt Euclidean. So when we width rotate, uh, by taking T E to I T, this vector becomes I T D Y plus Y D T. Which is I times our boost vector zeta Y. So rotations in Euclidean signature, of course, become boosts when you go to Lorentzian signature, when those rotations involve the Euclidean time direction. Now, it might kind of look like we're going to end up with an I. With a, it might look like we're going to end up off by an I compared to the formula we were trying for, uh, but we don't because there's also a rotation of the normal vector. See, when you, when you define the normal vector in Euclidean signature, the normal vector points like this. Okay, so the normal vector points in the Euclidean t direction. But when we talked about it in Lorentzian, uh, we drew this Lorentzian picture, t was going up, and the normal vector in Lorentzian points in the Lorentzian t direction. So if you follow these through, um, the normal vector rotates by minus i. Um, so in fact, q of d theta is exactly our boost charge Ka. And therefore, we've proved the formula. Um, this is e to the minus 2 pi ka. Yeah? Um, if we were doing this path integral in Lorentzian signature, would we still be allowed to do a re-slicing with a rotation of um, um, No. No, so in, in Lorentzian, 
you're, there's, well, there's no killing vector that does this in Lorentzian signature. So, so there isn't any way of slicing the path integral that way. Um, and really, the Hamiltonian can't take you from space-like slices to time-like slices. Um, so, so you can never, you can never flip it. Um, but the, yeah, so the, the analog of rotations in what, what starts out as rotations in Euclidean um, becomes these boosts when you go to Lorentz. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, so this derivation crucially relied on the fact that you, uh, the interval that you considered was a half line, right? Yes. So like, uh, that's why you were able to re-slice the integral. So that's correct. What if I consider, say, like some small segment or something like that? That's a good question. Um, we might talk about that in some more detail later, um, but let me give the quick answer now. Um, let's take region A, well, let's take region A to not be a half space, but to be a strip of finite width. Then in Euclidean, the, the Euclidean picture uh, for rho A would be very similar. It would look like this. Same argument. You just take the definition of matrix elements of rho A, you do the partial trace on region B that glues together the part outside. So you would get the same picture for row A. But in general, there is no nice way to write this as the exponential of a conserved charge. The best you could do would be some kind of like path ordered exponential. Like you, you, can, slice, you can slice a space time any way you want. Like so for example, you could slice this space time like this, and now there's sort of a, 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 a flow vector field that goes around like that. Um, but in a general quantum field theory, that's not a symmetry, so there's not some nice way of writing down that path integral. In a conformal field theory, in two-dimensional space-time, this is a symmetry. So you can write down a nice formula for it, and I think we'll probably do that later, but in general, if you have some crazy region, um, or even just a strip in a higher dimensional or non-conformal theory, uh, the best you could do is, is to write down this, this path integral, and it's hard to get further. You can do like perturbative calculations in free field theory, things like that, but you can't write down a general expression. Yeah? This might be a dumb question, but what's to prevent me from calling like one of those nodes zero, and then like rotating the Strip like around it with itself, just like with the thing that was longer. Um, we literally just doing exactly what we did. Well, I think what you're saying is you want to slice it the same. Okay, so you want to slice it this way. Yeah. Um, the problem with that is that the if you want to think of this as cutting up a path integral, then the boundary conditions for this path integral would need to be specified on the full slice. Okay, so if the, the, the rotation charge acts on the Hilbert space associated to this whole slice. Or in other words, when you impose boundary conditions, you need to supply field data on the whole slice. I've already summed half of them out. What? I've already like, summed a lot of that data out. Yeah, so it's, I mean, you, you can cut the path integral that way. 
um, but it won't give you the operator that's, a, that's an operator on this region A that you wanted. Other questions? Sir, you said uh, like the calculation would simplify if I work with CFTs, right? So two like, dimensions, uh, yes. Oh, uh, I was just thinking like, can you use scale invariance to push the point away to infinity or something like that? In two dimensions, yes. In in two dimensions, the uh, the the finite strip is conformal to the half space. In higher dimensions, um, the analogous statement is that the the uh, ball-shaped region, the finite ball-shaped region is conformal to the half space. So you could do something similar for a ball-shaped region in higher dimensions, CFT. Oh, Okay, so now I'm going to turn to the physical interpretation. First, I just want to uh, state some things in Lorentzian signature. So let's write down some coordinate systems. The Euclidean coordinates um, that are nice to talk about Grindler space are the um, cylindrical coordinates dr squared plus r squared d theta squared plus dx perp squared. So these are the polar coordinates that I was talking about before. I just didn't, didn't write them explicitly. Um, they're cylindrical coordinates because they're, they're polar coordinates in two dimensions but then every, all the extra directions just come along to the rough. When we go to Lorentzian, uh, we send theta to I eta. So that gives you the metric ds squared minus r d eta squared plus dr squared plus dx perp squared. So uh, these are known as Rindler coordinates. The relation to the ordinary Minkowski coordinates um, well, let me write it first. So it's T is R sinh eta, and Y is R cosh eta. So if you plug in this coordinate change, then you find the metric is the usual Minkowski metric minus dt squared plus dy squared plus dx perp squared. So where does this come from? Um, this is basically just your usual change from Cartesian to, from polar to Cartesian coordinates with an extra i. Okay, so if we take the Euclidean coordinates and go from cylindrical to Cartesian, then put in this i, then that's what takes us to ordinary Minkowski coordinates. 
on the space-time picture what these coordinates look like. So if I have, if I start in Cartesian, well, I, I take the Cartesian directions, t, y, as we've been. Then uh, what this coordinate system looks like is sort of like a polar coordinate system. Um, so what I'm drawing here are the slices of fixed eta. And I can draw the slices of fixed R. So those are the slices of fixed R. So this is the court, this is the Rindler coordinate system. Eta uh, is the time direction, so eta is running up this way, and r is going out that way. Now notice in this coordinate system uh, that we have to take big R greater than zero. There's a horizon, the metric components, the metric becomes singular. Um, so there's a horizon at R equals zero. Um, so we have to take R bigger than zero. And that means that the Riddler coordinates cover either the right or left patch. In other words, we can put down two different Rindler coordinate systems, one on the right patch and one on the left, but we can't go continuously uh, across that, that singular point where the, where the coordinate system breaks down at the origin. Of course, nothing funny is happening in the space-time, but the coordinate system is no good at zero. So in Rindler coordinates, uh, we cover this patch, and eta is time. Ka, the boost charge, is the corresponding energy. And um, from the point of view of the Rindler coordinates, um, rho A is really just thermal in the usual sense. It's a thermal state uh, in terms of the energy that's natural to find in these coordinates. I'm going to try to draw a picture it recaps this path integral derivation. When I tried to draw this in my notes, it just made things worse. But let's try it and um, let's see how it goes. If it's not helpful, then we'll just go on. Um, put down my notes. This is okay. <laughs> okay. So the way I like to think about it, let's start with a Lorentzian picture. Okay, so space-time is the board. And that's where real physics happens. Um, but we're going to use the direction out of the board as the Euclidean space-time. 
OK. So there's this direction out of the board. Let me um, draw t equals 0. And then we'll draw a direction. See, this is where we're going to get into trouble. Um, so there's this direction coming out of the board. There's a half space coming out of the board. And of course, there's also Euclidean space goes into the board. Okay, so we just have two per perpendicular planes. One is the Lorentzian, the Lorentzian space time on the board, and there's a perpendicular Euclidean space time coming out. And notice that, that there's, a, there's a line where they hit, right, where, they, where these two planes cross. That's the line t equals zero which, of course, is also Euclidean t equals 0. Um, so that, there, there's this intersection that belongs at t equals 0 that belongs to both the Euclidean spacetime and the Lorentzian spacetime. So if we think of the state, if we think of we're looking for the vacuum state on that t equals 0 slice, um, then What we're supposed to do is, so what we're supposed to do is, the, is do the path integral on the lower half Euclidean plane. That prepares the vacuum state on t equals 0, as we described, right? And then we can evolve it and do physics in Lorentzian signature. If we do things that way, um, in the sort of Cartesian slicing, uh, then we imagine doing the path integral well, let me draw a different picture for this. So what we've done is we've taken this space time and, and, and carved it up two ways. Um, in the first, in the Cartesian way, we, we, we slice it according to Cartesian time in doing the Euclidean path integral. That prepares the state at time zero which we can then evolve into Lorentzian time using the Euclidean slicing. Okay, so we prepare it Euclidean, we evolve it in Lorentzian. What we've done instead to talk about Rindler space uh, is to take the Euclidean and, and slice it in the polar direction. So we, we're taking Euclidean and slicing in the polar direction, and that's defining for us a state um, only in region A. That's, of course, going to be a mixed state. Now, we had a pure state in the full system, where in the full slice on, 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 on all of space, region A, union B. If we trace out some of it, it's going to be mixed. OK, so we did that path integral by doing a, uh, by going around the polar angle of the Euclidean space. And the natural, or the, the continuation, the analytic continuation of that slicing into Lorentzian is the Rindler coordinate system. Okay, so we, if you carve it according to the polar angle in Euclidean, then when you get to Lorentzian, you're going to find um, that your slicing looks like the Rindler time slicing uh, because you have eta, um, or rather theta, is, is, is I eta. Okay. I don't know if that was helpful, but we're going to draw pictures like this when we come to black holes, and they're going to be super useful. Was that helpful? Questions? Yes. It sort of had to be like this. Like you couldn't cross the, the it's called the light front, because otherwise information from the B that you had sort of forgotten about would come in. Yeah, that's right. It, there, it would have been crazy if we were able to evolve up to here, so up to, I don't know, some slice like this or something, right? Because that, that includes, you should only be able to evolve in your, in your causal development. That's right. Other questions? Again, 
th but this, this Rindler um, evolution, the Minkowski Rindler evolution, it's only because of the, Ham the this angular Hamiltonian that you've chosen. Um, like it didn't have to be that way. You could, you could. I mean, I'm not trying to say this. Yeah, this Rindler slicing. It's only because of the Rindler Hamiltonian. Um, natural. Yeah, that's that's. Well, this is just a natural coordinate system to use. So I want. I should emphasize that. And. See, I, I did it backwards from the way most books do it, and if you haven't seen the way books do it, it won't feel backwards, but um, you know, most, most sources will start by talking about Brindler coordinates and then tell you that there's some property of Brindler coordinates or of accelerating observers, maybe, that gives you thermal, the thermal density, some thermal properties. But I want to emphasize that the way I described it, uh, this equation is completely coordinate invariant. Okay, this is the density matrix associated to, to this region. And you could use this equation to calculate the state um, on, on this slice if you wanted. Well, I don't know if I made that space like. I should have made it space like. But um, you, can, you can use this equation to calculate the quantum state on that slice, and then you can evolve in time and, and, and use it to, to cal calculate the quantum state on that slice. It's a completely coordinate invariant um, equation that makes it clear that um, yeah, so we didn't, we didn't have to, we, did, we don't really need to go to Rindler coordinates to, to make this state. Yeah. So in the beginning ish of the class, you said that if you are on region A, you can use the density matrix of, of A, and that's equal to using the full density matrix. So if I'm standing in region A, not accelerating, yeah. standing still, I am not going to see thermal state. Correct. This density matrix is equal to the full thing, which is just vacuum. That's correct. If, uh, uh, someone standing still who just happens to be on this line, which does go through region A, if this is their world line, then they will agree with me that rho A is equal to this. Um, but that's just a mathematical statement. And if they go to like calculate their thermometer, what, what their thermometer reads, it will say zero. Okay. Well, in vacuum. And how do you see that? Um, we're, I'm going to talk about thermometers at the beginning next time. I think I'm out of time, so um, I want to do now, but that's the last, uh, yeah.